So this isn't just simply trust or confidence, but, it, but it's, it's, as we start to look, it's really a, a, an, an action of laying down our life in obedience. We're going to find, guess what? To the modern man's ear, this is the worst word that's ever been spoken, obedience. We're going to find obedience at the very core of being a believer. It's at the very core of Jesus' existence on this earth, obedience. Obedience. And he says, you know what, if I obey, you have to obey. So to be a Christian is to be obedient. You can't be a Christian and not obey. It, it, you can't. Because you're, not, not my words, we're going to see, it's, it's not my words that are telling you that. Don't take my word. Read the word. And it's going to tell you that to be obedient is the primary, fundamental thing that a disciple needs to be. And we're going to go on and do that here in just a second. So, if you look at that bottom slide, bottom right slide on page one, so we're going to talk about this content of believing, as I said. And one of them is what I call the how of believing. So we're going to act about, okay, so what does that mean for me? What do I have to do? And you see the one word there, obey. And I, I, that's just, that's, we'll see. It's the way that it is. For John, the second one is that you could ask the question, well, why do I believe? For that aspect, and that's love. I believe and I obey out of love. It isn't, it isn't being subservient as a slave to a master, but it's putting yourself in service to the other out of love. Precisely as Christ did. Right? He put himself at the service of his Father for the, our benefit. The love of the Father and the love of us. Primarily the love of the Father, because the Father sent him. That was his primary response. He didn't primarily do it for us. He did it because he loved his Father. And that's what his Father desired. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. That's why the Son came. We have to remember in our life that it's not primarily the neighbor that we love. It's that we love God first. And we love the neighbor because of him. And we forget that sometimes. And then we get caught in these social justice circles where we end up serving and serving and serving and God has nothing to do with it. We only serve because we love him. Very important. You lose him, the social justice turns in on itself and it becomes an idol. Keep focused on him and you'll be able to lay yourself down in a way like he did for that neighbor and serve them even more. Because in the midst of that, you'll give them God too. Because that's what's most important. More than food, as you're going to see here. Just a second. And then lastly, this result of believing is <clears throat> this word called abiding. As translated as abiding. This is this Greek word, this Greek verb, man. And we'll talk more about what I mean. Because we don't use that word very much in modern parlance. And so it's kind of an odd way of translating. So we'll break that open and understand where we're getting at. So we want to move along because I, I, I don't want to keep you too long and we're only one page in that area. And we've been going for a long time. So I'll, I'll, speak, I'll, I'll speak like an auctioneer. I can do that. That's my thing. <laughs> so this, but, but I want to take these first bits because it's so important to establish, I'm going to, keep, I'm going to keep hammering on this. It's so important to establish obedience as the central aspect of the disciple. Obedience. And where do we see this? If you look on the scripture, John 3.36, it's like the fourth down on the sheet, or you can read it off of the slide on the top left one on page two. What we find is, and you could accuse me if you've read the book of John very often, you'd say, Mike, David Michael, the word obedience never occurs in the gospel of John. And I have to say, oh, you're right. Never. Not once. And then you're going to say, but then how are you telling us and beating on your podium here that this has anything to do with the Gospel of John? Yeah. We'll get there. So the first slide tells us, very important, that the word obedience doesn't occur, but its antonym does. Disobedience occurs only once, but it does in the Gospel of John. And let's read this text, because what we're going to see is a mirror reflection, in a way, of the purpose statement of John, now written in the third chapter of John. 
So let's read it. It's right here. It says, He who believes in the Son has eternal life. We all know that, right? We read that in John 20. We know that exactly. That's almost verbatim what we read before. No reference to the signs here, but, right? The one who believes has eternal life in Christ. Okay. Now, here's the important part. The second statement of that is, he who does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God rests upon him. Now, wouldn't you expect that it would say, he who believes in the Son has eternal life. He who does not believe in the Son, not, does not believe in the Son, does not have eternal life, and the wrath of God rests upon him. But very interesting that this word, <coughs> apetho, in Greek, means disobedience. So this logical thing says, positively, if A, then B. Now we're saying, if not A, not B. But we have this problem, because now we have belief and disobedience. But what's John saying here? He's equating, in a way, the word disobedience with the word of belief, in an opposite, an oppositional form. So in other words, if we flip this around, we could say, he who does not believe in the Son does not have eternal life. He who obeys the Son shall see life. So right here in the beginning, John is making this almost near identity. Almost a near identity between belief and obedience. The negative, yes. But it's the negative statement of the positive. So already we see, if we do not obey, guess what? We don't have that life we want. Clear as day, plain old book Greek but translated into plain old English, right? <clears throat> Very important to understand. Now, what we have to understand, though, is that that isn't that the concept, the, the account of obedience is not in John. Just that the word obedience isn't in John. And there's a couple ways that we see that the account of obedience is in John. One is the word, or the, the word in Greek for obedience is hupako. To hear is aku. Hupako is to obey. Aku is to hear. And so there's even a relationship in the Hebrew between hearing and obeying. Hear, O Israel, that the Lord thy God is one God, right? Deuteronomy 6.4. That hearing, that sense of hearing in the Hebrew is a sense of obedience. It isn't just that you hear and ignore or that you have sound go in your ear canals. But by hearing means that you adhere to it. Right? And so we see that in John. There's a couple places. If you look on your, um, to go a little faster, there's the 847, 10.3, and 10.27 are just examples where this verb aquo of hearing God is used, right? His sheep, you hear he, the sheep hear the shepherd and follow his voice. Well, to follow his voice, you're obeying the voice, right? And that just makes sense, right? So this aqua, the sense of aqua has a sense of obedience. But, but then there's two other words, I didn't put them on here. Um, one of them is to do the will of God, and one of them is to keep the will of God. Those two also have an account when used in, the, in context of this concept of or account of obedience. So let's go through some of these scriptures on obedience, because again, I'm trying to make this real strong point that obedience is the central term between believing and eternal life. It's obedience that's there. It's obedience that's there. So let's look at 434 and see what Jesus says. So this would be about halfway down on your scripture page. <clears throat> John 4.34. So this is at the Samaritan, this is with the Samaritan woman at the well. You know, Jesus is tired, he sits down, his disciples go off to get food. The Samaritan woman comes and he tells her all the stuff about her husbands and everything. She leaves to go tell everybody about this Messiah guy that's at the well. In the meantime, the disciples come back and they're wondering what in the heck he's doing, because Men don't speak to women like that anyway, especially not Samaritan women. So they're kind of shocked. They don't really know what to do. And, you know, they're kind of like, what is he doing, you know? And, they, and they're concerned for him, so they ask him about 
has he eaten? You know, like a good grandma. And he says this about eating. He says, Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to complete his work. My Jesus' food. Not his hope. Not his good intention. Not his, well, when I get around to it. His food. His food. The very core. The very thing that sustains me. The thing that I, if I don't have it, I die. I starve. I don't make it. I shut down. I'm worthless. It goes away. That food, that most fundamental thing, is for me to do the will of my Father. That's my food. That's the intention of my life. That food you eat, that's not so important. Just as he said when he was tempted in the desert. When he said that, that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So bread is associated with the word. Bread is that most fundamental thing. You can't live without God. The, re the mere fact that you exist, God has to will you at every moment. Because he has to give you existence at every moment. He doesn't have to annihilate you. He just has to quit willing you. So think about that. God wills you. He wants you. Every moment. He's the most important. His will is the most important. His word is the most important. And it should be our food too. And that's a hard thing. Because then it goes to this laying down our life. right? Because we have our own plans. We have our own dreams. We have the ways we think it ought to be done. And we can really tell God. I and mean, we can tell him a tiny thing or two. Because he kind of screws it up a lot, doesn't he? Especially when it's in relation to me. Because I wanted that thing over there, and he never gave it to me. You know, I need to have a little heart to heart with him and straighten him out on how to treat me. Because he doesn't do a very good job of it often. Right? 